This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien gets the show rolling with this week's grain market update. He explains why the markets are closing downward right now and what is happening in the wheat market overseas. Today's show continues with Luke Burning, Kansas Forest Service fuel specialist, to share about grants that have been awarded to a few counties in Kansas and how other counties could qualify to apply. Chip Redmond, K-State meteorologist, ends the show with a weather update. He says where in Kansas has received more rain and what the extended forecast looks like. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Friday show with a grain market update with K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Shelby. Dan, looking at the market, the markets have closed down a bit, and where are those numbers at, and why might that be? I think the market sentiment is that there are no immediate threats to the crops, and uh, when, in uh, years where we don't have uh, an emerging drought or any other major maladies. Uh, when we get to this part of June, it's not unheard of at all to see prices start to decline from late June on into harvest. So there, there is that there is that possibility for sure. Now, uh, perhaps we'll talk some more about uh, what I think the likelihood of that is later on. But, but you know, so we had uh, corn closed yesterday up front, 439 and three quarters for the July contract. And then uh, the December contract at 456 and three quarters. So, you, you know, you've got a, that's about a, a 16, 17 cents dif- differential uh, in, in that there's still some, some worry about what will happen, but that's, that's not, uh, I, I'd contend a major indicator of, of market risk. In fact, when you look at, at some of the weekly charts and, and look, look at the amount of variability in, in prices we've seen, uh, what, what you'd may call a standard deviation of prices, we really haven't had a lot of, of deviation or, 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 I guess, riskiness, volatility, well, since uh, probably all the way back to last October, a little bit in February, but just not a lot. And so, Corn, pretty comfortable right now with the numbers. Crops are all in for the most part. Pretty good crop rating, just one or two areas where where you have some some issues. But but really, as far as corn goes right now, we're, we're sitting sitting in hand with uh, with moisture and crops going forward. We'll we'll see where we go. Uh, I would say that here now next week, a week from today, on the twenty eighth of June, there'll be uh, USDA NAS. National Agricultural Statistics Service will release their acreage report and the SOX report. So that if there's a cutback because of some wet weather we've had in the in the corn producing areas and a shift over to soybeans, well that that could have an effect on the on the corn market. We shall see. And really, very much the same story right now. No threats uh, to the soybean cro- U.S. soybean crop. And uh, on yesterday's closes that. The July lead contract eleven fifty five and a quarter, and the November harvest contract eleven sixteen and three quarters. So, whereas for corn, you know, there's some uh, some actual actual climb in prices. Here you here for soybeans, you've all you're already seeing a drop of about about thirty five thirty six cents or so. So, not so much worry at this time about anything happening to soybeans. And and with that, you've got markets that can afford to go ahead and trade sideways, drift lower sometimes, and there's no other news that's coming in that's changing that. So yet got that. We'll come back, talk about some issues that'll affect that. And really, if there's this possibility of an acreage shift coming out of that uh, that report a week from today, the acre, USDA acreage report, then uh, I guess my first thought would be it might end up being positive for corn prices, but kind of a piling on of negativity negativity with increased acres, increased production prospects for soybeans. So let's just stay tuned to see what that all brings about. And then for wheat, of course, the big issue for us right now domestically is the wheat harvest in in hard red winter wheat country. And uh, I guess I'd say mixed results. And I think we were talking, you and I were talking before we came on air, as you 
talk to agents and others on their harvest reports. I think I think you're hearing mixed reports on that too. Would you like to say a word on that at all? People can hear more about it on from our Tuesday show, but really the extension agents, a lot of variability from what they're hearing from their farmers and elevators. Yeah, very mixed, especially in central Kansas, uh, especially so. So we'll we'll see where all that goes. Uh, but um, I, I would say for for wheat, uh, very pronounced. We we had kind of this tortured, jagged run up. Uh, from all the way uh, in uh, late April, early May, from a low about 575 up to about 750. And we've almost given all of that back now. We're, we're back down to about, again, uh, 592 uh, in, in terms of the, yesterday's close on the downside. And harvest is coming on. I would still say that the international picture uh, is, is dicey. And you can see that in that last that last USDA report. I really didn't talk about that last time when Guy and I were speaking on it. But just look at, at what happened just in one month. The uh, Russian production dropped 5 million metric tons from 88 to 83 million metric tons. Ukraine, Ukrainian production from 21 million metric tons to 19 and a half. European production down 1.5 million metric tons. And, and, ish, and those problems aren't going away. So and all of that still brought about a world minus China index stocks number of 18.5%. And that's the lowest. Well, we, we used to hang out pretty comfortably, 22, 23, 24. Well, we just keep chunking ourselves down into that. And, and uh, somewhere out there, it bodes for real volatility. But I, I've kind of become convinced that until we actually see a pickup in, in U.S. wheat exports and that, that comes in and affects basis and flows of grain out of Kansas that, uh, you know, the market can sit there and, and be pretty insulated from bearish positions just because, you know, we're not seeing any cash movement. So that's the thing to look for. In the last week on uh, on Monday, uh, the USDA came out with a, a preliminary early week shipment report said about 13.8 million bushels was shipped during the week ending uh, June the 13th. And we need a pace of about 13.9. If that holds up, if we get that every week, then that that'd be at the start of moving towards some uh, price pressure demand pull that could help the wheat market, but it'll have to be repeated. Dan, what prices have you been seeing from Kansas grain elevators? We're seeing wheat harvest, <laughs> and uh, there's a real mixed element to that too. And, and we try to we look at the prices in the area around Colby, Salina, Topeka, Garden City, Hutchinson, and Columbus, and you've got a variety of elevators. There's some there's some terminal type price leaders there, and some other more countryish elevators that uh, at this time are taking grain in. Uh, the price that stands out most is that the top price in the Hutchinson area of uh, 601, uh, based off of futures that day, uh, then, and as the cash market, 601 that uh, off of 592 futures. And so, you know, it's nine cent positive basis in the, in the, uh, Hutchinson. Well, and the new crop bid in July, which we're not to yet based off of, you know, that'll have to be off the September futures. You got a 21 cent positive basis. And of course that's, that central part of the state around Hutchinson is where we've had some real mixed growing conditions. So there you go. You know, it just kind of a lot of local supply demand issues at hand. Uh, and you also see pretty good prices for the new crop bid in Salina at uh, 18 over, 616 for, for July delivery. Well, gracious, that's that's a pretty good wheat basis also. But but you all but then you go out to the west and uh the north northwest Kansas basis, 39 under, Garden City, 19 under, you know, so we're we're mixed out there and uh Columbus down southeast, 29 under. Of course, they've had what their harvest come in before. So, so anyway, you ask how are, how are cash prices doing? The most immediate issue is what well, is a uh, wheat coming out of the fields. What's it coming to? Well, in some of these export oriented areas, we have some uh, have some pricing opportunities, and that you know that's indicative that somebody is is thinking they'll need some wheat to fill trains or you know to accomplish something in the ex, in the movement side so we'll see at least that's that's my take on it and what other thing in answer to that question uh, the corn market is still i think from where we're at right now it, from where we were about three weeks ago, where we're at right now, we've seen an improvement in corn basis. 
in some of these areas. And uh, so it, not a lot. We haven't gained a dollar, but, you know, 10, 15, 20 cents, something like that. And and that's just at elevators. You hear private reports of, an, of a feedlot or some other or other other buyer really, you know, apparently being caught short, offering a really, a really good bid. So um, that doesn't surprise me that uh, that we'd be coming into this last quarter of the marketing year and and uh, needing to needing to fill some gaps. So we're watching for that. Uh, soybean price is pretty weak all along, except again you've got uh, this pretty strong base bid, uh, cash bid eleven fifty five, and in the Hutchinson area even money with the futures, and that compares to everything else being at least forty five seventy. Or a dollar twenty in cases under. So again, you have some specific places around the state that have some pretty good bids, and uh, you know people have holes to fill in their supplies, and that that makes a difference. Wanting to make a quick mention of something really important when it comes to crop production, weather, and how is that looking like it might play into everything. Well, of course, our, our good friend Chip Redman uh, is a guy that said it best, but I but I would say that the USDA has has raised their likelihood of uh, of a La Nina weather event happening uh, July, August, September. And uh, it was about 60%. Now it's up to 65%. And that with us correlates with risk, the, the risk, the possibility of hot, dry weather. So uh, it's great to have this moisture now. We want to bank up as much as we can, because if we do get hot, hot, dry elements later in the summer, we'll, uh, we'll use up anything that, you know, there, there's the potential for drawing on those reserves and uh, and uh, having more of a crop stress situation than we have right now, and not just in, in Western Kansas, but in the whole Corn Belt. We'll, we'll see where that plays out. Dan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us our grain market update. Thank you, Shelby. Take care. That was K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show talking with a fuel specialist from the Kansas Forest Service, Luke Burning. Luke, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Luke, the Kansas Forest Service has recently received some grants from the USFS Community Wildfire Defense Grants Program. And what are those grants? These are grants that are administered by the United States Forest Service. They're another one of these grants that are funded by the, the Biden Infrastructure Law, the BIL. And so it's actually, it's a billion dollars that's being distributed over the course of five years. And so it's $200 million per year is being distributed nationally through this nationally competitive grant program. And so we just completed year two. And like you said, year two, we got three awards. We're going into year three now, gearing up to put some applications in again this October. But the Community Wildfire Defense Grant, the heart of it is really to help states and communities reduce their risk of catastrophic wildfire. You know, we all know that wildfire is going to occur. Fire is a part of our landscape. Um, It always has been and it always will be. But really the heart is how do we reduce our risk of catastrophic loss? You know, how do we reduce the instances where we are losing homes and lives? That's what we're fighting against. And so this grant is to help us do that. There's a few things that it can fund. So first is a community wildfire protection plan, which we may get into in a little bit, but you've got to have the the plan in place to then receive funding for any projects that you want to do. Because this grant, it's extremely interesting. It's It's a cool opportunity that it can fund fuels projects. And so when we go to a community and we look at a place of like, man, it would be fantastic if we could go in and clear some roadsides in this area and create some fuel breaks. Or it would be fantastic if we could go into this community and help them clear around their homes so that there's defensible space around these homes and they're not just, you know, socked in with eastern red cedar or something like that. That's what this grant can target is providing funding for those areas where you're like, man, if we could just get a skid steer in there, if we could just get some funding to help us um, clear these roadsides. 
this grant is for that. And so we have to have the plan in place and the plan has its own value and, and we'll talk about that. But the plan really unlocks our access to to funding to go after some of those places where we're just like, man, I, it would be fantastic if we could do something about that. Another unique part of this grant is that the matching requirements are significantly lower than comparable grants. The only other comparable grant requires 50% match. And so if you want 125000 from the grant, you've got to put up $125,000 in match. It's a 50-50 grant. And so, you know, that, that really limits who can come up with funding like that, you know. And you can do match that's that's in kind. So um, if you're doing prescribed fire, you can count that as match and, and we can work with that. And so it's possible, but it match can be a really limiting factor for who's able to apply for, for these funds. With the Community Wildfire Defense Grant, match is only 10% for the CWPP, the Community Wildfire Protection Plans. For the fuels projects, it's only 25%. And so it's half of what other comparable grant requires. And so it really lowers that barrier for folks, for communities that, that want to access this funding. The low match is a really significant opportunity with this grant. And with that, there is also a grant waiver opportunity. And so if your community is low income or underserved, we can actually um, apply for a match waiver to eliminate match entirely. And that that's huge. I mean, that's essentially free money. That's a huge opportunity that, that we are tremendously excited about. All of the counties that we've received application or we've received funding for, the, the three counties we receive funding for, we're applying for that match waiver. And we're hopeful that we will be able to get these plans, get the funding for these plans at no cost to the counties. That's a tremendous opportunity. And it's only a five-year opportunity and we're two years in. And so, you know, we're working hard to get these plans in place so that we can continue to to bring some of this billion dollars that's out there into Kansas. Luke, what counties receive these grants and how do they get implemented into those counties? Yeah, so the three grants that we received with our year two funding, it, it was for Butler, Chase, and Leavenworth counties. And so the plan with those is you know, all three of those counties need a community wildfire protection plan, which is kind of a, a comprehensive plan that covers everything to do with preparing for and planning for wildfire. It's got um, evacuation routes. It's got wildfire risk assessments, risk mapping. Um, a big part of it is that it it lists and prioritizes the projects that a community needs to consider when they're thinking about reducing their wildfire risk. So, you, you know, you get you folks, we've decided as a community that we need to go in and reduce fuel loads along the roads in this part of the community. And that's a priority for us, for example. And so to do that, um, our plan is to bring in a competent, experienced contractor that has spent years and years writing these plans in the western part of the country and bring in contractors that, that can develop these plans, develop these community wildfire protection plans. And so uh, the process will be that the K-State, because the Kansas Forest Service is a part of K-State, um, K-State will put these projects out for bid and we will solicit bids from contractors from all over the country to come in and work with our communities to develop, to develop these three plans for Butler, Chase, and Leavenworth counties. What are all the different components involved in a community wildfire protection plan? Yeah, so the community wildfire protection plan, it's, it's really an all-encompassing wildfire planning document. And so it covers the entire spectrum of it from evacuation planning, how you're going to receive your notices of evacuations. It will include risk assessments for different parts of the community. It'll have risk mapping. And so mapping what are our fuels like, where is our risk the highest in this community? And then a huge component of the community wildfire protection plan is prioritizing the projects that the community wants to get done. And so this is a very collaborative process. The contractor will bring in stakeholders from all over the community, whether it's, you know, you've got your emergency management, your your fire chiefs, you've got utility officials, county officials, road and bridge, um, any farm groups that are in the community, any prescribed burn associations that are in the community, bringing that core group of folks together and saying, hey, where do we see issues? And then what are our solutions? Coming up with projects and then 
bringing that list of projects to the community and having community meetings that are open to the public and and soliciting feedback from, hey, this is what we've come up with as the issues for our community. What do you all think? Is there anything that we missed? And then how should we prioritize these? That's a huge part of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And that's really why having the Community Wildfire Protection Plan is important before we go and apply for actual project funding is it shows that the community was thoughtful about what they're applying for. They, they've done the work. They've, they've sat down together and said, hey, this is actually what our issues are, and these are the solutions that we agree work, and we want to do this first. This is our worst problem. We want to hit this first. And so that way when we go and apply for fuels project funding, there's a degree of confidence that, that we've done the preparation before and that this is a good solution for our community. So that's an extremely important component. There can also be a component of, hey, what resources do we have available in, available in our community? What um, are the needs of our local fire districts? What resources do they have and what are their needs? It will also be filled with information about defensible space in the home ignition zone. And, you know, if you're a homeowner and you're you're thinking, what what can I do about reducing my risk of loss during a wildfire? This will be a document that you can go to and get step-by-step instructions of what you should do around your home to reduce your risk. It's really everything to do with planning for a wildfire. And as we're thinking about this, if a farmer's sitting there going, wow, I feel like this is my community, how do they go about maybe receiving money for a year three, four, or five? And so the pathway is it's got to come through the county, through the, your local emergency management. And so what I would suggest is to contact your local emergency manager and say, hey, I heard about this opportunity and consider sharing my contact information, which if we can put in the show notes, I'm, I'm more than happy to share that, putting my contact information there. But share my email, share, share my phone number with your local emergency manager and tell them, hey, this sounds like a great opportunity for our community. This is where I see that, man, it would be great if we could receive this funding. I think you should get a hold of this this guy that works for the Kansas Forest Service and see see if we can bring that to our community. Because at this point right now, we are gathering together applicants for year three. And so um, now is the time. If you think that this may be a good fit for your community, that you could use this in your community, now is the time to to present it to your local emergency manager. You know, we're doing our own work to get this information out to those folks, but local word of mouth, having someone come to an emergency manager from that community, um, it is more powerful than than me as a um, state employee saying, hey, I've got another grant opportunity for you. Knowing that their community is interested in it, that holds weight. And so that would be a great thing that I would suggest. Luke, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. That was a fuel specialist with the Kansas Forest Service, Luke Burning. You can contact him at his email, L-R-B-E-R-N-I-N-G at KSU dot E-D-U or by phone at 620-899-8765. I will link those in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Friday show with a weather update with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. Chip, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Chip, we've recently been seeing some rain. Yes, we have seen some rain recently, especially for those areas that have been successful already in getting rain, but we've seen some of that positive feedback come into play. The precipitation tracked, for the most part, from southwest Kansas into central Kansas, then to northeast Kansas. So those are the areas that have been the beneficiary of recent precipitation before this week, but now they got even more. We saw some totals of three to four, even some five inches in places in around southwest Kansas and northeast Kansas. Uh, so some big totals that had some really good localized impacts, but again, It was localized, wasn't widespread, but we did have enough rounds of storms that pretty much everyone got into the rain to some extent, except for the southeast. But that precipitation, thankfully, came. There was some severe weather with it. We saw some strong winds. Uh, We had some isolated tornadoes, mostly land spouts in the southwest. They didn't do any damage. And then we had hail. And the hail, as you get into June, we start to see hail less frequently. We start to see more wind. But uh, we, we saw some pretty destructive hail 
especially around the Manhattan area over a week ago last Thursday. And we had tennis ball to even baseball size hail that did a lot of damage. I know the greenhouses on campus have struggled. They've got holes in all the, <laughs> the roof tiles. So that's just unfortunate. But with precipitation, we get some of that. Has Southeast Kansas not seen any of that precipitation? Yeah, you know, the the rainfall, for the most part, has hit the Flint Hills and dissipated. That's in part due to the strong high pressure we have off to our east that's impacting the northeast with very much above normal temperatures. And that high pressure is just stretched just right where southeast Kansas has found themselves in a much drier regime because of that a higher influence. And those thunderstorms are tracking around that high pressure. So they're tracking through southwest Kansas to northeast Kansas. And southeast Kansas has been pretty dry. We look at just it's been 12 days since they've had a tenth of an inch of rain for a lot of southeast Kansas. And that's not a huge deal. But when we look at the forecast, it's very possible that compounds into a potential issue for ag, especially with any moisture, the timely moisture for crops. It was good for a wheat harvest, but uh, now as you get into corn and, and soybean in that neck of the woods, they need another drink to keep moving. Have we seen any drought monitor changes? Drought monitor changes this week were pretty minimal. We saw some improvements in the southwest. We saw some big rains. A lot of those big rains just missed the cutoff again. So we'll likely see more improvement next week. But we're also going to watch that southeast to see some potential degradation over the coming weeks. Chip, what does the forecast look like? So the forecast is complicated. We're in the middle of summer. We've got that strong high pressure off to the east. That is going to actually build back in and move back to the west and center more over Kansas again. And that's in part due to Alberta, or Alberto, which is the tropical storm in the Gulf that's going to go off to the west and eventually up around the Rockies and over the northern plains. It's going to go around that high pressure. And so that's going to actually strengthen the high further. And it looks like heat is going to be the main player as we move into early next week. And overall dry conditions, we might see a couple just scattered popcorn type thunderstorms with remnant moisture. We've got a lot of surface moisture in some places. So we could see storms there. But um, overall, thunderstorm chances are down until middle of the week when that high pressure starts to just slightly shift back to the east ever so much and in south too. That could allow that storm track on the periphery of it to just catch northeast Kansas um, with some more storm opportunities. But overall, I think warmer and drier is going to be the trend as we go through the next week. And a quick outlook on what the extended forecast is. The new Climate Prediction Center outlooks just came out for July and extended Above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation are favored for the entire state, really July, August, September, October, November. And so our wet period has definitely lasted longer than I thought it would, but it does seem to be we're getting close to that cutoff where we start to see maybe some more La Nina-like influence. And then we also have to watch the tropics because any storm like Alberta was small. It was very small, very minimal impact but is enough to amplify the pattern and to create a stagnant pattern of high pressure that could lead to really rapid drought onset once we dry out. So we're concerned about those things as we move forward through the rest of the summer. That was K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. That's all we have for you this week on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you on Monday.